Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Over Analyzes. Today, we are going to take a fully spoilery look at Kaiju Number Eight, Chapter Thirty Seven. And whoa, and wow, this was an amazing chapter. I mean, they all were. I said that every time, but it was. It hurt so bad to read this chapter that I had to go out and do hard physical labor for half an hour between every two pages just to vent emotional steam like a gigantifying guy kaiju. On the one hand, the plot was nearly completely predictable, with only one real surprise. On the other hand, it was so amazingly well done that I didn't care what wit. I know I harp on C.S. Lewis's advice on never pursuing originality, that originality will only be found, like your lost sunglasses, when you stop looking for it and clean the room. Focus on telling the truth and tell a good story and the rest will follow. Now, here is your final warning. I am about to give so many spoilers, so shoo shoo shoo. While you are gone, you can look at the links below the video to get a copy of my short story collection, Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, A Book of Human Absurdity. And I have big news, folks. After months of figuring my stuff out, I finally got my book onto, into an audiobook format and up for processing on Amazon. If all goes well, it should be available on Amazon, Audible, iTunes by the end of July. Uh, go, go check out the links below the video to order your own copy to listen on to on the way to work. Now, back to the spoilers. Out of four super intense and amazing character performances in this chapter, it's director Shinomaya who really stands out. With a single line, the creator cinches the fact that the man has been acting out of love and hope, not hate and revenge. He was deliberately hoping this entire time that Kalka Haibaino was what he claimed to be, but he had to be sure. This was not just a test to prove that Kafka had control of his body, this was the selfless duty of a soldier on Shinomaya's part. If they were to trust Kafka, they had to test him and see him at his worst, and the old man was the only one who could do it. So he put his reputation, his, his very life, and his relationship with his daughter on the line to give Kafka the only chance he had to live. Granted, there were self-serving reasons, the one, mainly the reason of getting Kaiju Number 8's power on their side, but look. Look at the last panel we see director Shinomai in this chapter. That old man is beaten to a bloody pulp, but he is genuinely smiling up at Kafka in response to that characteristic Kafka grin. This isn't a victorious or even a smug smile. This is the warm but subtle smile of a man who is genuine of one man who is genuinely glad to see another. We can all list the practical military motivations that would make director Shinomaya want to preserve Kaiju number eight, but in our last glimpse of him in this chapter, we are shown clearly that at least one motivation driving the old man to strap on that, those gauntlets and step into the ring one more time was a desire to save his soldier. What's more, I am pretty sure that Kafka knows it. At the end of our chapter, our boy is giving director Shinomaya that wide grin that first charmed Kikoru. Those two amazing men locking eyes and acknowledging the simple joy of having not only survived, but triumphed. It was a powerful moment. And even on the seventh read through, it still leaves me with an amazing emotional kick. I want to know what happens in the next few minutes in that room, and I am terrified that the next two weeks will be a time skip followed by world building with Reno and company out kicking Kaiju Keister with those other super recruits. Which will be awesome, of course, but I need to hear what Shinomai's next words are. I need to know what happens next, right there! As an author, however, I see this as a near-perfect cliffhanger to tantalize folks with while I wander over and do something else. We will see on Thursday, I guess. Then you have Kafka's role. We get to see both his selfish and his selfless side. We get to see how weak and human he is. We get to see the root of his own self-loathing and his genuine love for others. The chapter starts with him locking eyes with Kikoru through the observation window, and he sees her fear and other distress, which of course makes him vow to risk everything he has left if it means he won't kill her father right in front of her. But that motivation, his own willpower, driven by selflessness, are not enough. He fails in his attempts to escape the grasping flesh prison, if that's what it is, only leads to what looks like a worse fate, if that's what it is. Then he re I'll come back to that later. Then he remembers Mina's pledge that she'll be waiting and he snaps out of it. Now, I am not sure that this is all that it does. He has, or as if this is actually the cause and effect situation here. We know he has the flashback, we know he suddenly regains control of his body, and he has this flashback immediately after Shinomai admits that he had had hoped for Kafka, so it might be some element, element of validation from a commanding officer that triggered that memory of Mina in the first place, but it appears to be, at least on the surface level, Kafka's selfish motivation, the desire to be on Mina's side, that gave him that shonen protagonist boost that saves the day. But remember, this writer is an expert at hiding fascinating plot twists behind tropes. 
Also, this was after the cheerleading from Kokoro, so it might have been all and all and rather than an either or situation. But remember, this is a very, very solid shonen trope. The hero using the spirit of friendship to overcome the mind control. And I'm looking for a plot twist behind that, but I will get to that later. And third, and the third amazing performance comes from Kikoru. We get to see an amazing battle between her love for Kafka and her sense of duty to her word. She promised Kafka that she would take him out without hesitation if she ever discovered that he was just another kaiju out to harm humanity. And she flashes back to that scene hard in this chapter, as she is watching Kaiju number 8 take her father apart in front of her eyes. But as she told her father, she still wants to believe in him, and we are blessed with this wonderful little sequence of events. First, we see that Kikoru has her uniform jacket zipped all the way up to her chin, as is regulation, and her hands are pressed against the glass. Then, when things are at their worst and she is contemplating if she should intervene to save her father, her fingers are hovering over her chest and her uniform jacket is unzipped about to her sternum, revealing she has her power suit on underneath. She can jump in and intervene if she, if she decides to. Then, after she realizes that she still wants to believe in Kafka, we see that she has zipped her coat about halfway down, so she had started to break out of her coat, and she, she was physically about to burst into that room. But now she's yelling at Kafka to overcome the kaiju. Finally, just as Kafka plunges his hand into his chest, we see that her jacket is now zipped all the way back up, meaning that during the absolute worst part of the fight, when her father was just about to die, Kikoru made a statement of absolute faith in Kafka by zipping up her uniform jacket as a sign that she wasn't going to activate her suit. I can only imagine how proud Daddy must have been of her, even if, or even especially since, he isn't going to show it. His little girl just made a command decision to show loyalty to her soldier, to show faith in him, something that director Shinamaya has drooled into her as a core value as an officer. And now, and not only was she true to what is probably the most valuable principle he imbued her with, she was technically, tactically right in her decision to believe in Kafka. And because of that, she and the Defense Force now has not just a weapon, but hope. Believe you me, I will be coming back to this line, that hope line later. But this video is getting so long, that might be an extra, that might be an extra video in of itself. Now, I said there were four amazing performances in this chapter, and no, I was not referring to, oh no, Kaiju number eight is outstripping his expectations, Baldi. The fourth stellar performance was 100% Kaiju number eight. There is so much in what it does that is clearly deliberate. Now, it could very well be that it has nefarious motivations. I'm certainly not ruling that out, even in my own head canons. And it might have just not nefarious, but not good motivations. It might just have selfish motivations. It wants to live, and hanging out inside Kaiju Kafka is its only way. However, I have yet to see proof of any deliberate nefarious intentions. And in this chapter, despite number eight going completely feral and lo losing most of its childlike appearance, it still retains that look of childlike innocence in both the internal bug form and in one telling scene in its, this internal form. First and foremost, Kaiju number eight is clearly up against the wall almost as much as director Shinami and Kafka here. You can tell from the very first panel that number eight is near exhaustion. Way back in chapter 20, Kafka states that regenerating costs a lot of stamina, and that was after the loss of just half of one arm to Hoshina is slicing it off. Since then, Kafka has lost and regenerated several limbs while having to constantly regenerate from the brute force trauma to his body, and he's lost at least four halves of what he lost were in mostly human form. More on that later as well, that Kafka was in mostly human form when he lost those limbs. Then, Kaiju number 8 just straight up yoked its entire body away from its core and regenerated its entire body. So our jet black boy is now low on, very low on petrol. Then, when that final blast from the gauntlets hits him, Kaiju number 8 is clearly in a lot of genuine pain. Now, take a close look at that final close-up of Kaiju number 8's face on page 5. That is a very specific expression. In visual art mediums, it means mediums, and storytelling mediums, it means one thing, and something not unique to, ma to manga. That face is when the child who is in a battle way over its head is screams out, Why won't you just leave me alone? Think of a young character screaming that as someone prepares to land the killing blow. You've seen that dozens of times in manga and western comics, anime, and cartoons. And our next close-up is a bug form of kaiju number 8, as it grows in relative size to Kafka, just as Kafka seems to be escaping the flesh prison, seems to be, and, sw and then it swallows Kafka whole. Now, given that the in that inner Kafka starts to transform into a more kaiju-like 
form at this point, it is perfectly logical to assume that number eight is maliciously forcing a complete takeover of the shared body and Kafka's mind. We see cut Kaiju number eight's mouth close, and especially given the heavy implication that it that, that closing mouth bit off both of Kafka legs, and the clear visual that even in this internal psych date the kaiju body was spreading over the human body, it really looks that kaiju number eight has some either nefarious or entirely selfish purpose here. But again, this video is getting very long. I, and so I, that, my thoughts on that scene are probably going to have to be their own video. And I have some real thoughts on that scene. But anyway, here's a question. Here's a question that I have for you. Kafka had zero control over his flesh body while he, over, over the kaiju body when he was in that flesh prison. From the moment we see him go into that prison to the moment the, the bug kaiju swallows him and moves him from the flight, from the being trapped in the, that flesh to floating in that pond, Kafka has no control over his body. Zilch. Over the kaiju body. And then, almost immediately after he's transferred from the flesh to the floaty bit, he suddenly has control over his body again. Now, here's my question. Did Kafka really shonen protagonist his way out of, out of the, uh, out of Kaiju number eight's control, or did Kaiju number eight simply return control to him after a set period of time or a set of actions? So what do you think? Who did Kafka regain control by force? Or did Kafka unnecessarily stab himself in the heart after Kaiju number eight had willingly returned control of the body? So, what do you think? Am I giving the little guy way too much credit? Leave your thoughts in the comments below and go check out the links below the video to get a copy of my book, Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, A Book of Humans of Absurdity. Like, subscribe, and peace out, my wonderful. The book from author Betty Adams, Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, is a humorous look at human behavior through the eyes of aliens. This book is arranged in separate reports or essays, documenting the experiences with humanity through the lens of the aliens who have to interact with them. This anthology of short stories and vignettes from alien points of view highlights some of humanity's quirks we can all relate to. Author Betty Adams captures how strange and interesting humans can really be. This is a fun collection of stories you will really get a kick out of. Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data from author Betty Adams. Order your copy right now on Amazon.